All right, so let's go ahead and take a look. To begin with, let's just talk about overall body proportions because we haven't touched the, on these in a while. So the size of the skeleton, the size of the body, and we're getting to the, close to the point where we're going to start drawing the entire body every single time. So I want to refresh your memory on this, that there isn't one universal proportional system for the whole body, but there are a number of them that agree 90%, which are pretty useful. Um, one of them being that the body is seven heads tall, um, another being that it is eight. Anywhere in that range is usually acceptable depending on gender, um, body mass, age, that sort of thing. Uh, in Proko's videos, he was talking about how from the hip area down, you basically, you can subdivide where the hip attaches into even portions so that from the hip to the knee, from the knee to the floor, those are even proportions. But if you want to measure from the waistline, from the iliac crest, and we take an entire head, then you can go about two heads down and you're almost at the knee, another two heads down and you're going to be at the floor. Okay, so if you did two heads down from the iliac crest and you did the knee, then the femur would be very, very short. We don't want that. So we want to go down a little bit farther than that and make sure that the knee is just a tad lower, but another two heads and you hit the floor, which is not the ankle. So keep in mind that we're measuring from knee to floor and knee to hip bone if we want them to be evenly proportioned. I often use um, a couple different measures to kind of vaguely make sure that I've got a proportional person. One is that the elbows, if they're swinging in an arc, a circular arc from the shoulder, should be able to hit the 10th rib tips, the ones that define that um, thoracic arch. So you should be able to just hit those with your elbow. Another one is that if you extended the wrist out entirely, it would just about hit the greater trochanter um, and your fingertips reach to about halfway down the thigh. That tends to be true regardless of um, the age or gender of the person. Uh, even children tend to hold to those proportions fairly easily. So just as a reminder, those are some good images. I like those images. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> any questions about basic proportions or anything? So on um, from the hip to the knee, is that two heads? From the hip to the knee, if you're yeah. measuring, if you're measuring from about the socket of the hips and then going down to the knee, yes, that would be two. You've got something really loud in the background, Lydia. That distance, yeah, that's about two heads. About. Okay. Uh, all right, let's look at the bones first because there's far fewer than of the muscles. If we're not going to count all of the different bones in, in the foot yet, and we're not, and if we're not going to count the pelvis, which we've already listed out yet, and we're not, then we've only got these four. We've got the femur, which is the thigh bone, which extends all the way from the socket in the sides of the um, pelvis down to where the hinge of the knee occurs. We've got the patella, which is the small shield-shaped bone that makes up your kneecap. The tibia, which is the frontmost and larger of the two shin bones. I have a, a slightly more complicated uh, illustration down here to show the mechanics of those bones, but for now let's just stick up here. The tibia, you can think of this as being the tip, um, starting with the letter T, tibia and tip of your shin. If you hit your shin on something like you um, whack the side of a table or you get kicked in it playing soccer or something, it's that bony area that you're likely to be striking, which is why it hurts so much because the bone is very close to the surface in the very center of your shin. The fibula is the other one um, which extends down to the ankle and anchors itself um, sort of at the beginning of the uh, tibia underneath the uh, underneath the hinge of the knee. The tibia, uh, sorry, fibula doesn't really interact with the knee at all. It doesn't have anything to do with that hinging. Um, what it has to do with is allowing the ankle to flex 
um, left and right and uh, rotate left and right. So it's similar to how our forearm bones work. We haven't done arms yet, but when we do, we're going to find that we have a similar arrangement of one bone in the upper part of the arm, two bones in the lower part of the arm. And in the case of our arm, it allows for huge amounts of rotational flexibility. In the case of our ankle, it allows us a kind of minimal amount of flexibility, um, but we need so much more stability to keep ourselves upright that that's what that accounts for, okay? So if I bring it down over here, you can see the general kind of shapes that I'm drawing, by the way. Um, this one's a little bit exaggerated. Note the angle. Uh, inward stepping from the hip and then downward or a little bit less exaggerated we could say that the legs entirely slope in from the hip that's pretty typical of our bones um, not really entirely sure why this is happening except for perhaps to account for muscle mass but we have this kind of inward slope of our leg bones which then gets balanced out somewhat once you add all the mass into them um, just know that that's the case, that if you draw, I'll just do a, a real quick version over to the side. If you draw a hip area like this with legs that go straight down, whoops, there we go, then it looks very, very strange. But if instead you just angle them in a little bit, then it tends to look a little bit more natural. Really what's better than that is having a division between upper and lower, which is a bit more like I first illustrated where you change direction in the middle. So the hips do one thing, the shin does another, and that tends to be the, the most realistic of all. Okay. Any questions about that so far? Good? Okay. Uh, also, one more note just to make is that the center of the bones tends to be thinner. That doesn't really matter very much because you're never going to see that part, but the bones do flare out near the hinge. That is very important because it is a huge contributor to the shape of the knees when they're both flexing and when they're not flexing. So keep in mind that they, both of those bones flare outward, as we're going to see right here, um, and create this hinge shape. Okay, so this was... Um, both recommended from uh, Steve Hampton when I was taking classes and from Proko what I saw is a sort of architectural very very strict way of depicting these bones just so you can see what's happening um, there's this sort of channel here uh, between two tips on this bone it doesn't really look exactly like that but there is sort of a channel in there um, where tendons and stuff can attach and there's one primary tendon which attaches straight down over on this side and between the two of them this bone this patella sort of floats over the surface of this hinging area um, i would suspect that this is to protect all of the um, tendons and muscle attachments behind it from impact because it's so likely that we're going to kneel or crawl or just whack our knee on something as we're lifting our leg um, i don't know evolutionarily really why that exists or how that exists, whether or not it's common in other animals. I just know that functionally that's how it behaves. You'll notice that right now I have a, a right angle bend, femur going back in this direction, tibia going down in this direction, and the patella is facing forward. The patella will almost always face forward. So wherever the tibia, the front of the tibia is facing, that's basically where your kneecap is facing also. Um, so if you are sitting in a chair, and you can put your hand on the patella as you're sitting and then extend your shin upward, you'll feel the patella rotate with the tibia. Okay, so it doesn't match the femur, it matches the tibia. Okay. Uh, it does slide a little bit up and down as that action takes place, but the reason why we put this one is sort of a round shape is to kind of reinforce the idea that that's the one that's moving although really it's either one of them moving no colors on that part yeah on that book that she's, oh she's on the book yeah the yeah, book's that, all black and white oh okay yeah yeah okay so that's basically how this works the other really important thing about this is to note that um the tibia gets really really freaking thin Okay, take a look at that cross section down there that I've drawn. It goes from this big wide shape down to this really, really thin sharp shape. 
and the muscles do fit in very snugly all around it but it creates almost like the prow of a ship kind of triangular shape it's really really small um, i've got my skeleton right behind me that i can see physically and looking at it like the the fibula is even thinner than that a very very thin little bone um, seems like it would be easy to break but the tibia is very very thin and blade like so keep I, that in mind I see a lot of x-rays of that i broke my fibula last month oh no yeah saw a lot of a lot of x-rays of uh, the tibia and fibula. <laughs> how did you do it how did you break it uh, i stepped off of the curb and my uh my right foot landed on a big rock yikes so I didn't have my footing and it it twisted and okay yeah yeah makes sense so that the fibula it attaches to one of these back corners either this one or that one back there that would be through here I didn't draw this with any particular mind to which side we were looking at left or right but it's going to attach to one of the back corners and then attach basically side on so that the um, the tibia is making a big sort of shape like this at the ankle and the fibula would make a sort of smaller shape right next to it at the ankle eventually. So that's what happens way down at that point. But this is what you get at the knee attachment. Okay. Questions about that? If not, we'll move right along, steadily on. Steadily on it is. Okay. Don't panic. I know there's a lot of different colors here. I know there's a lot of different shapes here. Don't panic, okay? The lower part of the leg is fairly simple for artists most of the time. Um, there are a lot of muscles down there, but we don't really have to memorize all of them because only a few of them are usually visually evident. For the upper part of the leg, there are a lot of visually evident ones, but we group them into the common um, sort of shorthand names because they're much easier to remember that way. So to briefly show this part over here, for the upper part of the leg, we've got the quadriceps group, which is the front of the legs, the adductors, which is the crotch portion, okay, the hamstrings, which is the back, and sartorius, which is just one extra special one that kind of snakes its way across the top of the quadriceps and makes a particularly noticeable pattern. Uh, in this illustration over here, the sartorius would actually sort of define this edge right here where the quadriceps end. So it's one that we tend to include. Um, quadriceps refers to four different muscles, but I would say for now, you don't really have to memorize all four. You kind of have to memorize the overall shape and then the fact that there are a few recognizable places where the muscles are likely to bulge, um, which I've tried to indicate here by drawing them in a bit more extreme ways. Okay, So to take a look at this, first that special one that I mentioned, Sartorius, okay? that's this one that is going in a snake pattern right here. Okay, it goes all the way up to the um, greater trochanter, but it really only kind of defines this look. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what it's for. I think it's for rotation of the, of the upper leg or to aid in the rotation of the upper leg. Um, it's not one of the big primary muscle groups that we use for everything like running, jumping, climbing. Um, it just creates a very noticeable pattern on the surface. So keep that in mind. Um, then we've got these four. One, two, three, four. One of them is crossed out because that one is entirely underneath the surface and we don't see it. Okay, The place where that one is, vastus intermedius, is underneath this rectus femoris. It's going right through the middle in here. Since we don't see it, I would say don't even worry about that one at all for now. I'm trying to simplify things. These two, the last two, vastus lateralis and medialis, medialis is the um, yellow one so that one right there and then the uh, lateralis would be this one right here okay the reason those two are identified separate is because they will definitely bulge even if a person has moderately good um, quadrilateral strength or quadri quadriceps strengths okay so you will have 
a bulge over on this side or a bulge over on this side, usually both because it's hard to work out one of them without working out the other one um, when someone tenses their leg. Given that these muscles are on the front of the leg, right, they're on this side. Oh, I should probably move my camera just a little bit so you can see. This is a side view, this is a front view, this is a back view, okay? So given that they're on the front of the leg, what are they doing to the leg when you flex them? The extension. Yeah, they're extending the shin down straight, right? So when you flex them, there's tension on this side, you get a straight leg. Okay. The opposite of that, the one on the back that is um, tensing and bending the leg, that's what we call the hamstrings. They're these ones back here, but we'll get to that in a sec. So we've got vastus, lateralis, and medialis, and then intermedius, don't worry about. Rectus femoris is the last one in the front, and that's the middle one right here in between them. Okay. It creates kind of a teardrop sort of shape. Um, I haven't colored in all of the ends of these muscles because they kind of end up combining into a big huge fascia area but it's all of this all of that that i just darkened in across the um the patella underneath the patella around the patella all of those attached to um, the lower bone so that would be the tibia so that they can lift up the leg okay but really where they bulge is where the colored in portions are and it makes it a little bit easier to deal with visually so the overall shape is of this kind of flame like thing like this if i just darken in that whole area i think of it as sort of like a, a candle flame or something that's the entire region um, from the side it's really just kind of one big bulge usually although depending on the level of exercise that a person has had you could see differentiation between the different groups it depends um, but the reason that we don't see that these muscles wrap all the way around and bulge continuously is because of that fascia that we talked about last time with the gluteals that runs down the side this big well actually that's what i drew there was the um the uh, adductor but it's in the same area it would be on the opposite side on the outside pulling it flat okay question about that group you guys good yeah okay let me turn it off for a second okay so we can see femur underneath in fact let me turn off most of these there we go so if i turn just the quads on this is what we're talking about specifically the reason for the holes is that we're not seeing it they're poking around behind other muscles in those views okay so the adductors are ones that it helps to have everything off at first to see what's going on Basically, the entire inner surface of the bone attaching to the groin area. Okay, so this is for pulling your leg towards the center or across the center. This one has a very interesting um, sort of shaping characteristic in that it's responsible for this part of the cross section of the thigh. So, in order to simplify these things, I've got these cross sections over here on the left hand side. Um, the thigh is just sort of a big oval front to back, but it has this large bulging area on the inset of it, um, which is what this adductor is, okay? If I turn these other groups back on, look at how much of the adductor is still visible once I get all of those on. Um, it's not a whole lot of silhouette. Like, that's a butt cheek back there, that purple bit. Um, this is a part of the uh, hamstrings which are on the opposite side of the leg most of the left hand portion is covered by quadriceps there are other small muscles that cover up over this area but we really will only kind of see it when you spread your legs out or if there's a lot of tension holding your body into some um, spread legged position then you will see it in a major way um, there's one big ropey tendon that goes from the crotch area out to the leg that's the adductor that's what where you're going to see it most okay but it does create a little bit of the silhouette shape of the leg if we are ignoring genitals or if we are ignoring butt cheeks or something right otherwise it's just the hamstrings that are going straight up this is the part that kind of rounds out that that angle okay 
Any questions so far? All good? All good. All good. And I included the um, glutes in here as well because when you do this without the glutes, it looks so strange that we've got this big cylindrical shape that just stops there. Uh, if I add in the glutes, then we can start to see, oh yeah, that round wheel shape starts to you know, fill in all these areas. I think I probably wasn't generous enough with the, the hamstrings on this one and probably need to move the bone back a little bit, but I think you guys get the point. All right, <clears throat> let's look at hamstrings then. They are the opposite side of the quadriceps. So I'm going to turn off most of these. There we go. So the hamstrings are on the back of the leg. They are comparatively flat and boxy uh, compared to the, uh, the quadriceps. And they have the interesting feature that on the bottom of them, I'm looking at the back view primarily, um, where they attach down to the bones, they have to interlock with the calf muscles. The calf muscles dive inside the hamstrings go on the outside and they create that characteristic shape of the back of knees that you're probably used to seeing where these two very strong vertical lines. Um, those two very strong vertical lines are almost certainly hamstrings, not um, calf muscle. Okay, But that's where that back of the knee shape comes in. In actuality, these are two different muscles, um, but you can treat them as one overall shape. If we turn these back on just to see how they interact. They are oftentimes visible from the front, especially when you start to coincide with the knee. Um, they will create some of the softness around the sides of the bone of the knee and a little bit of the meat there. You can even see them poking out around this adductor uh, most of the time, but they're most prominent from the back, of course. And from the side, they will usually um, fill up most of the, the line if you divide in half uh, the leg from front and back most of the back of it is going to be comprised of that although some of it is quadriceps if you notice right here this is still a peach color um, this uh, quadricep I forget which one that is that would be lateralis vastus lateralis goes underneath or around the adductor and so the adductor comes right out of the middle of that which is kind of interesting and complicated but remember use this kind of shortcut shape for now because it's gonna be a lot easier to deal with while you're getting familiar with all of these bones and muscles. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions so far? No. Nope. Good. Okay. Um, there's also these kind of rhythm lines that I've drawn over the top of the uh, muscles. We've got this one right here, this one right here, and then even another one down in the ankle. These rhythm lines are more appropriate for gesture drawing and um, motion, but they're a reminder of where the form is bulging and where it is not. Take a look at the thigh overall, and you'll see that the, the most uh, distal part of it is sort of low, whereas on the inner part of the thigh, the most distal part is kind of high up. And that's an important thing to take note of because almost all muscle groups on the limbs do this. Instead of, and let me just draw this over here, instead of doing this where we've got the upper part and it bends equally on both left and right, and then the lower part and it bends equally on both left and right. It's hard for me to even force myself to do this. Oh my God. It's a chicken leg. Yeah, it's like um, hot dog links or a chicken leg or something like that or a bowling pin. It's not right. Um, and it's one of the, the primary mistakes that a lot of young artists make is thinking that everything's symmetrical all the time. It's definitely not. Um, instead, for the thigh, we've got a lower bulge on the outside and a higher bulge on the inside. And even just doing that, even just altering it a little bit, tends to make it feel a bit better. Um, same thing happens with the opposite effect on the calf where we've got a higher bulge on the inside, typically, and a lower bulge on the outside, typically. And you can see how much better that starts to feel already. Uh, another thing that's typical is that one of these two will have a more relaxed uh, angle and the other one will have a more aggressive angle. In the case of the calf, the outer one has a more aggressive angle. The inner one has a more um, stretched, uh, relaxed angle. And for the thighs, it's opposite. 
So this one, all together, all of these muscles make for a more relaxed angle. And then this one tends to go up and have a sort of sharp kind of angle to it. And that is something that usually opposes throughout the body as well. Um, the difference between the more aggressive and less aggressive angles. So if I wanted to make this even better, I'd make this one a low bulge but lazy, right? And then this one, I'd make it more aggressive like that. And then for this one, I'd make this one more aggressive, which I did by accident in the very first one. And then this one I'd make more lazy. And we're starting to get the shape of the leg already. What we're missing is the, the knee shape that I didn't put in on any of these, which would be defined partially by hamstrings and partially by patella and partially by femur, okay? But those rhythm lines are just there to kind of establish that there's an important difference between the angles, the maximum angles of these curves, okay? It's starting to remind me of like the the Roman style of how they sculpt the bodies. Mm -hmm. Think of like Hercules, the way the cartoon, the way they shape the chins and the legs. <laughs> it's very emphasized yeah. on that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they had a really stylistic kind of approach, and some of it, yeah, it does mirror what the bones and muscles are doing. Yeah, and some of it's just stylistic, just for like making cool swirlies and stuff. Um, all right, so that's basically the thigh area. Um, any other questions or comments about that? In general, let me let me say this about the thigh as we're looking at this kind of shortcut shape over here. In general, the front of the, the thigh is a little bit rounder and tends to come to more of a point, and the back of it is a lot boxier the outside of the leg, as in the part where your hip would be or your pocket would be, tends to be significantly rounder and flatter. And the inside, as you can see down here, tends to be sharper because of that um, adductor shape. So it's something like this. This is a little bit more complicated of a shape, but it can be simplified significantly. But usually the back of your thigh is going to be a little bit boxier and flatter. The front is going to be rounder. And then, as, as I've said before, like they tend to oppose. So Whereas this is pointy, this is flat. Okay. That, that makes sense to the muscles. Uh, the hamstring is like a square, boxy muscle. Yeah. And then it has like those rounder muscles. Yeah, and if we were able to bisect our arm, some of the same stuff would be happening there too. Where this would be tricep, this would be bicep, this would be the outer surface of your arm, and this would be the armpit where it's going to head over towards, you know, pecs or you know, uh, latissimus or something like that, right? Um, the same sort of thing happens with both the upper and lower limbs, just to a greater or lesser degree. But yeah, when people work out their biceps, they do have a rather square shape to them, which is interesting, just like the hamstrings do. All right, so then let's move down to the lower part of the leg. The lower part, it has nearly as many muscles as the upper part, for instance, here is a um, chart that I've got in your module. So yeah, we do have uh, soleus, um, fibularis longus, fibularis brevis, figure, um, fibularis longus again for some reason, extensor digitorum longus. We don't need to memorize most of these though because they're only really going to be visible on someone in, a, in an extreme athletic kind of circumstance. It's nice for sculpting. It's nice if you're dealing with very, very muscular people. For everyone else, you're basically just going to see calf muscle and then one of these others, which I'm saying is the tibialis anterior, which is the most prominent one for the front. The rest of them are just kind of a round shape that happens. By the way, and you're welcome ahead of time, this is the name of the calf muscle. It's that pronounced... wrong. It's wrong. It seems wrong because it was a um, a, uh, a bastardization of a, of a term for the stomach when they looked at the muscle by itself. They thought it looked like a stomach and then named it that because, I don't know, they had no foresight that that was ever going to be confusing. Gastrocnemius is the, the way you say that. And we are going to call it calf. Okay, so up here, I've got the actual name here grayed out. Call it the calf muscle. Okay because you're not going to need to call it gastrocnemius. That's just a Jeopardy question. Okay, the only two 
that we're really dealing with are the calf muscle and the tibialis anterior, which is better seen here. Tibialis anterior is this one, which is just to the outer side of that sharp tibia bone. Okay, Fibula, by the way, down here is the outside of the two bones. Um, sorry, fi yeah, fibula is the outside of the two bones. Tibia is the inner of the two bones and also forward. Okay, so this one is the front muscle. These two back here, right? And this one says fibularis longus. Yeah, that's technically true, but the the calf muscle is right there, right behind it, bulging it out. And so we might as well just use the calf muscle as a shorthand. Okay. So that would be this one in green. You can see that one is definitely the most recognizable, easiest to identify muscle on the on the lower part of the leg. It has its own rhythm of leaning more downward towards the inside, upper towards the outside. Technically, it has two heads. You can actually see them develop pretty prominently on anyone who runs or uses a bicycle all the time. Um, that's pretty easy to see. And whenever you point your toes, that is the muscle that you're using to do that. So squeezing in this area will result in rotating downward of the toes. Um, the other green part here, that's the Achilles tendon, which is um, responsible for attaching to the calf muscle to the um, calcaneus, which is the heel bone um, down in the very back here. And the Achilles tendon uh, getting its name from the mythic story of Achilles having that tendon slashed and being unable to fight, which is a real thing that happens to people sometimes and is horrifying. Um, don't look it up unless you are a um, very strong stomach because it's one of the most disgusting uh, effects that takes place on a muscle outwardly. Okay, From the side, it is absolutely easy to spot. Um, you can also see the interchange between hamstring and, um, and I keep wanting to say gastric nemius now that I've got it in my head, calf muscle. Um, from the back is the most prominent interchange between those two where we've got hamstrings on the outside diving straight down in a boxy shape. This area, by the way, is filled in with something. It's just not something that we're terribly concerned with. It's mostly flat. Um, and then these dive inside and attach themselves to the opposite bones. So a combination of the two of them help to manipulate um, the knee joint as well. Then on the front, we've got this one, which is... Um, what did I call it? It's tibialis anterior. Tibialis anterior. So outside edge of the tibia on the front. This one would be responsible for tipping the toes and foot upward. So stepping upward in this direction. Typically a little bit visible from the front as well. There's a lot of other stuff that would be taking place on the front. Okay, but we do have a small bulge on the front before we get to the knee area like that. Mostly the back of the knee or the back of the shin is defined by the calf muscle so are we gonna work on six um, muscles the upper ones or are we gonna work on the bottom ones too all all of them the whole leg yay yay the whole leg okay so then if we can move to that um, what is the name of the, the bottom part of uh, the green area? Is it come from all the way from the hip down? Is it the same muscle? No, they are not the same muscle. I, I, there's a big difference between the top and the bottom. Very little crosses over the boundary between the knee. The only stuff that does is, is what is visible um, right here crossing all the way down. That would be the hamstrings. No, the green on the bottom is a completely different muscle. And the red on the bottom is a completely different muscle from the red on the top. Okay. Okay. And then, um, but we need, well, um, I was just wondering because um, there's no names or oh, are, are the names there? I was, I was just reciting the names. Uh, also, oh, okay. in, the, in the module, it's right here, but don't use this. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Achilles okay. tendon okay. is right there. Um, yeah. Tibialis right here, anterior, is on this one. Yeah. And then we've got the the short list is right here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So use yeah. that. Thanks. Yeah, I didn't write it in the in the image, I guess. Did I? No, I guess I didn't. Whoops. That's okay. Okay. 
And then for the um, cross section, because I think this one is fairly easy to memorize as well, you can sort of think of it as a peach, kind of a upside down peach, where you've got the cleft in the back between the two um, calf, <laughs> I keep wanting to say gastric, maybe it's muscles, between the two calf muscles. And then on the front, although it's not completely triangular, it's very, very close to triangular, with the outer edge, this one being where the um, um, tibialis anterior would be, with a slight bulge on that outside edge. So think rounder on the outer side, flatter on the inner side, although you can get all the way out to a three-tiered sort of thing like that, almost like how the knee is, um, depending on muscular development. But I tend to think of it as um, sort of a an egg shape with an extra extension uh, and an upside down peach with the, the cleft being on the back as the cross section that you can use here. Okay. Last bit that's important for um, rhythm and bone purposes is the fact that the ankle is slanted. The ankle slanted outward on the outside, downward, inward on the inside, upward. And those two bones would be the fibula on the outside, tibia on the inside. Okay. All right. So in our uh, homework, um, mm -hmm. do we draw just the lower part of the body or should we draw the whole skeletal structure and then add the muscles to the legs? Just the lower part of the body <laughs> is okay here. If they're doing something weird like curling up in on themselves where you've got to put you know, hips and rib cage really close to each other and figure out where head goes. Go ahead and do that. But we're really only concerned from waist down in this one. Awesome. Okay. And you guys can also start combining the whole of the um, the gluteal group together into one big shape. Now that you know that there's a wheel shape that there's an upper and a um, lower portion to it and a front portion. As I've done here in purple, that whole gluteal group is one shape. I would also typically make the whole quadriceps area into one big shape and the hamstrings and um, calf muscles we're already treating as one shape, even though they're two. So you can treat the whole quadriceps area as one shape um, if you like to, but I do want to see the definition between the different parts of it. So if you're going to draw it in one color, that's fine, because you're going to run out of colors if you don't. But I want to see that you know that there's one bulge on the outside, one bulge on the inside, and then between them and above them, one bulge between. And those are separate, different details of muscle. right? They kind of create a triangle shape, sort of an elongated triangle shape there. OK? OK, so like um, like we did with the, the traps, kind of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the traps are, yeah, there are absolutely several different, you know, sort of separated muscles, but we treated them like a dagger, just like that. Awesome. Okay. All right, you guys. That's basically all I want to show you. The rest of it is in these infographics and the videos. But if we're going to call it short today, that's where I would want to call it because my brain is shutting down on me. Okay, so there's six six new muscles for us to learn. Is that correct? Uh, calf one, tibialis anterior two. Um, quadriceps group is four, but let's just say that's three. Four would be adductors. Five would be hamstrings. Six would be sartorius. If you're counting them that way, then yes. Okay, thank you. But the the pink area, the pink with the mixing with the the uh, glute gluteal area would kind of be considered. We can do it as one. Um, are we talking about quads? What are we talking about? The the thighs. The thighs are on the front quadriceps, which is four different distinct muscles that you can treat as one, and okay. then the sartorius, which is the S shape, which is separate, and then the hamstrings, which is the back shape, the yellow shape that goes straight up. Okay. So at minimum, there's three different muscle groups plus what's happening in the glutes. Okay. So the, yeah, the, the green part, the hamstring, and then the, the quadra, I don't know how to Quad, say it. Quadriceps. Quadriceps. And then okay. sartorius. Like, don't forget the sartorius because it's the, the S shape that defines the top of it that is mm. separate. 
That one is an important one. Okay. All right. Um, do, we have to, do we have to draw the, the, the green one? Yes. Okay. Do we have, do we have to draw like both? Yes. Yes, both of the legs. Although Robert uh, brought this up as a point of contention last time, and I said you only have to detail the muscles on one of those legs if you want. What I'm going to say is that I recommend that you do 20 muscle legs, right? 20 muscle legs, which okay. might just be 10 poses. Okay. Right? 10 poses would be would equal 20? It could. <laughs> But now imagine that you've got a pose where you can't see both of the legs very well. Do a different pose, right? Okay. So if you've got one that they're like sitting on their legs and one is bent directly away from you, bent up like this, and now their butt's in the way, but their other leg is sticking out this way and we can see this one, well, you're gonna need a new pose, right? So 20 muscle legs might be the equivalent of 10 poses or, you know, more. 10 to 20 poses who knows how many you're going to get. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you know how you told me to draw a figure? Should I just do one page if I'm doing a leg? Oh, no, I don't do the whole body, so... I yeah. Do one, one page? Yeah, this one's just waist okay. down, so... Okay. Yeah. But it'll fill his full body just one page. If... Wait, I'm confused. So if we were to draw a full body... Yeah, we're working up to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little confused about what your question is, but I think you're saying like if you were using up the whole page and the whole body fit on that page, but now since you're only drawing the lower half, you've got half the page left over, so you can do two lower halves. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yes. That's because it's so complicated. Yeah. I mean, if you want to draw the whole body, go for it. I'd love that. But I'm not making you. I'm having mercy because there's so many groups here in this, and we're doing like twice as much as I think we should. We should probably spend a week on the upper leg and a week on the lower leg, but we're not. So I'm saying, yeah, just do it from the waist down. Yes, yes. Those are kind of necessary. They they interlock with too much. They they interact with too much. So yeah, we kind of have to include those. You guys don't have to include abdominal muscles or obliques unless you think it is necessary for the pose that you're doing. Then by all means, put them in. Okay, and then um, the poses that we are to look for uh, do they all need to be, um, doesn't matter the pose, can they be all front, front or side, or back? Or? You, should, you should look for a variety. It has to feature the legs, and you should probably look for a variety of flexed and unflexed legs in different directions. But other than that, does it matter? Not really. I mean, if you want better athletic sort of depictions of what the legs are doing, then look for like mid mid-motion athletes or dancers or Olympians or something. But I think quick poses can probably supply a number of good poses for this one, provided that you don't include clothing. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, anybody else? And I already popped this into uh, Discord, by the way, and pinned it, so if you want this image, it's sitting in there. All oh, labeled awesome. up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, you guys. I think that's going to have to be it for today. My brain doesn't work so well. I will be back up to full thinky strength next week. <laughs> this is just a one-off fluke because I was confused about what the secretary at my hospital said. <laughs> okay? Okay. Hope you feel better. Oh, I will. Thank you. Night, everybody.